Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the closing session of our training session, Human Rights and Business. Uh, it's been two days with a diverse amount of topics, diverse amount of expertise, uh, diverse amount of problems, and also, and I hope this is the, the note we end on despite the gloomy uh, question of, of the prior panel, uh, hopefully diverse amount of solutions. So to, to close, sort of close our panel, our, our training session, we've sort of adopted this, uh, this format uh, that we've named European Dialogues, and, and the idea is that we have as democratic of a presence as possible. So instead of having our panelists close the session, we thought that it would be nice to close the session with our participants. So let me introduce to you who is with us today, uh, who have been following patiently uh, our discussions. Uh, to my left is uh, Malin Johnson, who is a law student doing her postgraduate studies in Stockholm, Sweden, in EU law. Next to Malin is Susanna Sanchez, who is a recent graduate of the University of Deusto, where she studied a double degree in law and business, and is in, about to begin uh, her next job at the Spanish Embassy in South Africa. Uh, next to Susanna is Paige Morrow, who is a Canadian lawyer who practiced corporate litigation for several years and is currently the head of Brussels operation for the Frank Bolt Society on Corporate Governance. So, Oh, what I like to do is attempt to give a bit of uh, a global view of, of the subjects of the, of, the, of the two days, sort of the first domino, and then sort of head down the row and open it up to the floor and, and try to get your general ideas and, sen and sensations of the training sessions and see if we can leave on, on some note of not just of ending, but hopefully and ideally, optimistically, of continuing our, our work and our ideas uh, in this conversation and on this challenge. Uh, so, I want to sort of end with where, end the training sessions with where we began, which is with our keynote speaker, Antonio Vitorino, the former uh, Commissioner of Justice of the European Commission, who mentioned that the EU Charter reserves very few fundamental rights, very few human rights for European citizens. In fact, guarantees those rights for all. So it's sort of uh, something that we should consider as we discuss the, the application of the promotion of human rights and, and allowing for access to remedies outside of the European Union. Uh, and then it turns to our challenge. So how do, we do how, do we, how do we handle this challenge? How do we provide justice when rights are violated by EU corporations outside of the EU? On this very point, he himself mentioned that you have to be, and I quote, sufficiently, sufficiently imaginative to find coordinated solutions between legal systems. So what, in, what does this collective imagination uh, involve? Well, as we know, and as we've discussed in the last two days, it involves a number of actors working in a number of different fields, a uh, number of dis dif disciplines facing different challenges. Um, we talked yesterday about the idea that there's a divorce, the metaphor was used, between the need to protect human rights and victims and on one side and businesses need to compete, and the hope is that this does not need to be a divorce or a separation or, or competitive or exclusive ideas, but we need to find a way to bridge the needs and advance common goals. Uh, we heard various interesting interventions from the business community, uh, and Deutsch Kortem mentioned that uh, the interest of his company to be an example, but at the same time wondering and questioning how, how to compete when companies that do not, with companies that do not respect human rights. Um, and so well, what, one thing that I started noticed in the last two days is we highlighted a lot of the problems with, with this issue and, and something that's come up and one thing that I encourage us to do going forward and inspire those of us watching via streaming and those of us that are here today is maybe try to replace, replace this approach with a more solution-oriented methodology as we move forward. Uh, also admitting that there is no one-size-fits-all. Uh, it's, it's, it's not one question and there's certainly not a one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, this is a conversation and, and most importantly, an area of work for all. Um, so this uh, sort of an idea to sort of move down the panel to begin with, trying to give some, some cohesive idea to our discussion. And, and, and I'd like to really hear from those of you who are listening uh, what were your impressions? What stood out? Uh, 
What are you thinking? Malin, I'll start with you. Yeah. Well, firstly, thank you for sending me the invitation, which made me come here quite spontaneously. Uh, for me, it's been a very interesting day uh, with many interesting and instructive presentations uh, concerning different topics um, in human rights and business. Uh, human rights and business, as we've seen, is a global issue which makes it important to have these kinds of conferences uh, where different people from different countries can meet and discuss uh, to keep developing the protection of human rights. I myself found the, um, the session on non-judicial judi judicial, uh, mechanisms very interesting. And it made me think and realize um, that my knowledge is actually quite limited on um, alternative dispute resolutions. And also the time spent in teaching uh, these matters is uh, quite little, I would say. Um, and therefore I believe that training sessions like this is a great initiative that should be taken seriously and supported. Uh, Professor Catherine, said that she didn't want to start preaching about the appropriate dispute resolutions, as she called them. I would say that you got me inspired to get involved and that um, I think, I believe that we need people like you with enthusiasm to keep projects like this to keep involving. Those are my general thoughts. It was very interesting and very, I learned a lot, I think. <coughs> Uh, good afternoon, everybody. As uh, she has told just now, uh, I realized that I have uh, a very whole of knowledge, but um, I think that we have been speaking about what can we do for uh, avoid violation of human rights and what have to do the government or ONGs, but in fact, I think that we, the citizens, we can do many things for avoiding this these problems. I'm living in South Africa and there are a lot of policies to avoid racism and human rights violations. But the problem is not also the government, what, is the, what are they doing, but also the people. I have been rejected for, from uh, many companies just because the color of my skin. And in contrast, I have been paid more than three times the salary of a black person. And that's not the problem of what the government has done, but what the people and what, is the, what the managers do to avoid this uh, huge problem. And it's not the government, it's us. Uh, thanks so much for the invitation to this event, uh, which has been a great opportunity to hear some of the perspectives of both the academics working in the community as well as SMEs that are uh, attempting to cope with these challenges in their day-to-day -day business. Um, as someone who worked in Canada working with primarily larger corporations but also some smaller ones as well, I think what became apparent to me working there was the disconnect between the external legal framework and the understanding of both, I mean, business practitioner or business leaders obviously, but also in-house counsel in that they were perhaps aware of sort of some of the, um, I mean, they were there was a lack of understanding of, for example, the need to respect this as a human rights, anti-corruption regulation, and to ensure that they have res responsible supply chains. So Catherine, in her presentation, I think did an excellent job of referring to the importance of training and education. Um, Ian Binney, for example, has been quite active in this area. He's been partnering with the CCIJ in Canada to develop trainings on this for lawyers um, and in-house counsel to sort of raise capacity. In the EU, it was quite striking at the recent multi-stakeholder forum that there was a, a clear lack of engagement with businesses in terms of building capacity. On the resolving dispute side, um, again, just from having practiced law with businesses and being involved in mediation, um, the, it's quite a, it was quite apparent that there was a, where business Businesses had an ongoing relationship with the individuals, with the claimants. There was some, usually a possibility of bringing them in the same room uh, and having mediation, but where there was a protracted legal dispute, court usually was the only outcome. That being said, 
In domestic legal systems, we obviously have enforced mediation, which requires the parties to be in the room and preserves confidentiality while the court process is ongoing. Um, and so uh, interesting possibilities are there for hybrid processes. And looking forward to hearing what the people from the floor have to say. Impressions, thoughts, remarks, doubts, concerns? I don't know whether I'm the only one in the room, but I really wonder what the European Union is trying to do with this collective research. So if you could give us a bit more information about the mandate you have, um, what they are expecting, what is the calendar, uh, and who, who is, I think it's DG Justice who gave you the mandate, but who particularly in DG Justice are you talking to? Are the people aware of those issues and so on and so forth? I mean, a little bit more background. I, I'm sorry if this has been done the first day when I was not here. Just forget about my, my question. No, it was assembly done very generally on the first day, but uh, to give a bit more background about our work and, uh, and our work with our local partners as well. So we have a mandate from the European Commission DG Justice, specifically the Civil, Action, uh, Ju Civil Justice Action Grant. Uh, to do a two-year length project with three work streams into research, into training, and into dissemination. So this is the first of four training sessions uh, in with uh, the challenge question being access to remedies for human rights violations by EU companies abroad, um, generally. And, and so through our training sessions, and, and one of the goals that we were hoping to do today is, in these two days is, uh, bring this issue to, to our local community, uh, raise consciousness and show the scope uh, and, and the challenges and try to begin to discuss uh, what sort of solutions can go forward. And, and this is something that we'll do on a much more technical level in, in our research reports which tackle private international law obstacles largely but, but also uh, more generally corporate obligations, non-judicial remedies as well and dissemination. Uh, we also are very fortunate to have local partners and patrons, the Foundation for the Cultural Capital of San Sebastian 2016, uh, our hosts uh, today, the San Telmo Museum, uh, who are also very invested in, in European challenges and, and have given us this format of, of which this training session forms a part of, uh, European Dialogues, which is where we use cultural spaces uh, the museum particularly, to, to bring these pertinent issues to the local society. I think one of the, particularly with the European elections last year, we, we, there was a lot of discussion in, in our local community here in the Basque Country, in San Sebastian in particular, about the distance of, of Brussels from this community. Uh, and I think this distance is well real in certain senses, but also perceived. And so one of, I think, our responsibility as, as people that, that, that work in, in policy and in law and in culture is, is to bridge that gap and, and to allow for accessibility. This event, for example, is free. We're streaming. These videos will then be available online uh, and, and not just through our project web pages, human rights and European dialogues, but from the Cultural Capital Foundation, from the museum. The idea is to, to sort of bridge this distance, this perceived distance from European issues, to make these issues real, put them front and center in the hands of a local community, uh, and, and hear back, which is specifically what this platform is for, which is why I know that it's always nerving to speak in public, uh, particularly for, for people in this community, but we, we would like to change that culture, and not just here, but in other places as well in Europe, that a European citizen, regardless of, of where they live, has a voice, and it's as relevant uh, as anyone else's. So we want to encourage that kind of new citizenry moving forward. I don't know if that answers that, your question, or maybe it goes beyond into an idealist category, but that's what we're trying to do here today. So on that note, I want to hear from anyone that's present with anything to say.
Uh, I think it's a great idea. Um, we have to combat uh, apathy and anomie uh, across, uh, well, probably not only Europe. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, and I, I think if something that could come out of this in the different uh, uh, European uh, countries that are participating is uh, to encourage the civil society groups or the formation of groups who are going to push their governments and push these mechanisms to to come up with better solutions to these problems. And, and as Katrin, I'm sure, will be reminding me <laughs> to engage uh, <laughs> with, um, you know, because business isn't a monolith and, um, you know, there are voices in there that can be helpful. But, um, you know, so that we have a more sort of nuanced approach. Um, I, I think that would be a great outcome. <laughs> No, in particular on that point, uh, we, we have been speaking a lot about the role of states, and in no way do I want to undermine the absolute importance for regulation and for, for states and, and duty to protect, but as we mentioned uh, in, some, in an earlier panel, there is duty on one side, but there's also responsibility, and that responsibility, I think, is an individual one, as much as it is one of corporations or larger entities. And, some apathy is a, a bit of the challenge to overcome in that area, but this is, you know, these events is, is one act, right? We, we used the grain of sand metaphor earlier, but um, there is something we can do, small or large, and it's a, at least, if nothing else, creating a dialogue on these points is, is something to do. Uh, Catherine, you had a point. Um, one idea that uh, actually <laughs> was not originally mine, I have to give back to Caesar what, is, what pertains to Caesar. Um, I attended the third, I think it was the third forum in Geneva on business and human rights. And at the end, the last plenary session, a very young lady, very young, even younger than you are, all, all the four of you, um, came out and uh, took the floor. She was very brave because in the big, you know, <laughs> Geneva room with uh, everybody there. And she said she is um, a business law student. And she regretted that those classes on human rights and businesses were not taught to business students. And I took that idea back to my school and proposed to my colleagues to open my own seminar on business and human rights, which is now taught only to human rights students, to open it up so any student in the business uh, stream could actually register for credit to the seminar. And the answer has been no, we don't allow that. Well, first of all, it's the French way you have to, you know, it's very complicated if you want to open a new seminar and so on and so forth. But there was absolutely no interest from my colleagues in the business stream to actually start a dialogue on this. So I was, I was I, actually, I'm, I'm not taking a no very easily, as you probably all know by now. But um, I, I think we have to continue to do that. But I think this young lady had exactly put the right um, uh, nail on, on where, where it is. So perhaps that's the one thing we could suggest to the European Union, um, but that would not be under the justice, that would be under the education, whatever stream they have, to actually fund special chairs in universities around Europe um, to cater to students both in human rights and business, together, in the same room. Because it starts there. If those young people are educated in this way, then, you know, we can, we can build on that. I don't know if, uh, we have three that have actually studied law. I don't know if you want to speak to your experience with legal education, and obviously in three different, very different countries on that point. Maybe just briefly, um, going back to the first point about the way that is currently structured in the EU, I mean, I think what's fascinating working on corporate governance right now is that for understandable reasons it's housed within, well, it's been moved actually into DG justice with the current commission. 
And the CSR, on the other hand, is under DG growth. Even the name, the change of name, um, implies that it's, the focus is strictly on economic growth. And so the focus is exclusively on CSR as being voluntary. And any hint of um, external regulation is deeply discouraged and, and not a point of conversation at, there. So I think as long as it's currently set up in that way, it's quite difficult to have a discussion about flexible, the smart mix between voluntary versus external regulation. On the other hand, with the curriculum, um, just cur the issue of curriculum reform is critical for business schools, obviously, and there's been a number of um, initiatives working on that. So 2020s, we're working on business school reform. I think there's also a lot of discussion about law school or curriculum reform because students leave with uh, understanding of corporate governance and company law that is extremely shareholder centric at the expense of employees, communities, environment, etc. So I think a business in human rights seminar would be critical and quite important, but I think also the risk is that only a very small percentage of students that are already sympathetic to that will take those courses, predominantly female uh, is the reality. But if we are able to at least um, shift the understanding of mainstream curriculum to have a broader view of the role of companies within society that might reach a broader group of students, both within business schools and law schools. Um, well, I study law and business, and uh, known in one of the of the both degrees, I never heard anything about human rights. Well, uh, in one subject, yes. Uh, the one that uh, Katerina taught me in the university, but the rest of all human rights weren't in the in my in my subjects in my subject. All was uh, benefits, rights. Uh, what's forbidden was not, and human rights is something that is over there, lost in nowhere. And this is something, the, the language, not just the discipline, the breach, uh, the gaps between disciplines, but in language, one thing that came up a lot, particularly in the preparation of this event, uh, was we really wanted to engage different stakeholders. Uh, that's also part of our mandate from the commission. And one thing that was very difficult was to convince the business community that this was not only, well, the relevance was, was somewhat noted, um, but their direct implication in having something to say was not was something that I, was a convincing work uh, effectively, and what was interesting is when they did come and they did participate, which I thought was a really valuable intervention, and I appreciate their appreciate their uh, participation very much. They began to see that there is a connection. The problem is is the language that we use to discuss these issues between lawyers or policymakers and the business community is very different. Uh, in one of the com conversations I had with. Uh, one of the business associations, local business associations, so when we spoke of human rights, like, oh, human rights, I'm sorry, I'll stop you there, that's law, I'm not a lawyer. I was like, well, let's talk about things that you do uh, that promote, uh, say, your employers or, or the communities. Oh, well, we build schools and we provide health services and you know, certain steps that were very clearly in the promotion of, of human rights, but that le the language was different. And so once we started realizing that we were speaking of similar goals, uh, then the conversation changed. What was different though were the values attached to them. Uh, and so I think there's work as we just, as researchers and as we form our recommendations to be very conscious of the language that we use and, and who is our, our target audience and to be as inclusive as possible. And, and that means maybe being a bit more generous with our approach to these concepts. Uh, more comments, Philip. Uh, well, there are things that we can do better in this respect when we speak about education. Is there a textbook on business and human rights? Is there a textbook on CSR which wouldn't be you know, <laughs> meant for public relations people, but that would be meant either for law students or business students? Um, and I've been contacted by people from Leiden, actually, who were part of our project, but. I understand that they are not anymore. And they were playing with this idea of actually creating such a textbook. So maybe that may be, that may be something for the academic community to, to work on. Obviously, it would be of little use if it, would, if it would be a book written by 
only academics. It would be much more interesting if there would be some, actually some texts from people from practice, from legal practice, from business practice, and also from, let's say, the NGO sector. Obviously, if there is a public support, I mean, from the states, from the European Commission, towards such initiatives and toward building such, uh, you know, materials, resources, uh, and for changing the, uh, the curricula in the end, they would be desirable. I appreciate that. There's a common theme that I'm picking up from a lot of the comments, which is things that we can do, practical steps that can be taken, whether it's drafting of a textbook or a curriculum change uh, or redesigning. Uh, more ideas on that point from, from any of the participants or, or those of you sitting here. Any practical steps that we can take? Just a really small one is our own project will be coming out with a handbook. So again, I think the having... Um, texts that are written at different registers from everyone from academics to CSOs to members of the community to you know that are working directly on business and human rights versus ones that are not but may come into these contact with these issues and then just have a, a, a starting place a, for a reference that they can then um, if they wish to they can know where to go for greater information that would allow I think the project to hopefully hit a greater number of people across a spectrum of interests. Any other concluding remarks or impressions? Okay. Uh, if not, I would like to thank you all uh, for your participation and assistance and all of you who have been joining us via streaming. Uh, also to keep in mind that the work obviously does not stop today. The conversation, the dialogue does not stop today. Uh, you can follow us uh, on hashtag human business, uh, sorry. Hashtag Human Business EU or uh, EU Dialogues and, and let us know your ideas. Um, thank you very much and good luck with your work going forward, all of us. Good afternoon. <laughs>